What a thought that God loves you and I, even in our sinfulness. As we've been walking through our relationship series, I want to encourage you today to open your Bibles. We'll be in 2 Samuel, we'll be in Psalm 32, Psalm 51. And we want to see what God says to us, not just as imperfect people, but as people in desperate need of His help. And so we're going to learn the awful consequences of sin and the beautiful grace and freedom of forgiveness. So stay with us, open up your Bibles, download the app, and join us here at Hardin Valley Church. It's a family service today in that uh, we take the last Sunday of every month and we invite our kids to stay. And we provide them with some worksheets, stuff like that. And we won't do that. How many of you nod your head? How many of you think young people ought to figure out how to be in service and, and hear preaching and kind of get, get used to it? There's such a thing, there's a, there's a documented phenomenon, to be honest with you, where young people are highly stylized, uh, highly um, uh, almost entertaining, but they come from that and they come to a service where it's, it's so different and then they just, they just bounce so hard. And so, man, they need to do that, they need to be able to figure out how to worship with their parents. And so, and so we, in, we invite them. So we've been doing that for quite a while now. But if you see young people here, and if you see them with crayons, things like that, it's because we gave them to them. We want them to do that. They, they, can, uh, they can write some of the notes down and color out. We're going to talk about David today if they want to do that. And so, so they do those kind of things. And, then, and then, uh, then rejoicingly, man, they usually hand off the stuff. They hand it back. And so uh, we, we, enjoy, we enjoy being able to get that and, uh, so, and have that. And again, to all our guests here today, our guests, man, we're just so thankful for you. And, uh, and so if I haven't got a chance to speak, to you. I look forward to doing that. <clears throat> and so, and, and then if you haven't got a chance to grab that connection card, you can get, hand it to me and put it in the black box uh, as you walk out. And we'd love to just send you a thank you note. That uh, means so much. And we got some special gifts for you. And we want to, we want to do that. I was, uh, <clears throat> I was joking with the uh, congregation I was preaching to last Sunday down in Alabama. And I said, yeah, our, uh, we have to have coffee after service because it helps people, you know, be able to drive, be able to drive home. And I had about six people going, you know, that's just not a bad idea. And, uh, and I didn't have the heart to tell the pastor, man, your folks are, your folks are not, you're not playing. Uh, so uh, see, anyway, so we had a good time. We're in 2 Samuel this morning. 2 Samuel, we're going to start there. I hope you got a copy of the notes as you came in and uh, we'll refer back to them. And, uh, and I, want you to, I want you to be able to have that <clears throat> in particular. We, we started a little series on relationships. We're going to kind of run through uh, Father's Day, uh, Lord willing, and we're going to really transition to something I think uh, be not only appropriate, but I think be a great time. We're going to do something I've not, <clears throat> I've not done uh, here and, uh, and not really looked at in quite a long time. We're, Lord willing, we're, heading, we're going to head into the end times. We're going we're to start our way through uh, the book of Revelation, my, my, my joy would be to try and do that between now and Christmas. And so I want to do that. Again, to all our, all our folks, we're so thankful you're here. And we're going to read several of these verses. If you are willing and able, stand with us. We'll be seated for a minute. Just verse 1, chapter, excuse me, 2 Samuel, chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord sent Nathan. Nathan's the prophet unto David. David's the king. Same David killed Goliath. David is uh, now well into his reign, verse 1, and he came to him and said, there were two men in one city, one rich, the other poor. Nathan comes in, he's got a story he's going to tell David. David doesn't know. Verse 2, the rich man had many flocks and herds, had exceeding many flocks and herds. Poor man had nothing save little, one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished up, and it grew together with him and his children, did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup, lay in his own bosom or breast, and was unto him as a daughter. If you're writing a children's book, this, this lamb is fluffy. The children all have big eyes. Everything's done in pastels. There could not be a more intimate, wholesome picture to a shepherd king than what he described in verse 3. Verse 4, there came a traveler, a rich man. He spared not to take of his own flock and his own herd. He's got a whole bunch of stuff. Instead, he does what? He said to dress or kill and prepare for the wayfaring man. But he took the poor man's lamb, dressed it up for that one to come. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He didn't finish the story. He said to Nathan the prophet, As the Lord liveth, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. He comes from, goes from spinning a yarn to David just immediately reacting. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing because he had no pity. Verse 7, David said to him, You are the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives. For your harem there and gave you the house of Israel and well of Judah. If that had been too little, I would moreover have given you such and such things. Wherefore have you despised the commandment of the Lord? Do evil in this sight. 
Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite. Thou hast taken his wife to be his wife, and you have slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. You had him murdered. You had him murdered. Verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Skip down to verse 13. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And David, Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Verse 14, how, how be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion, the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that's born of thee shall surely die. And we'll just pause there. I want, I want to help us. So our relationship to sin, our relationship to sin. Would you pray with me, Father, from front to back and left to right? Would you speak to every heart? I pray you'd help us this morning. I pray you'd help me, Father. I pray you'd help me focus. I pray you'd help me, Lord, as I'm uh, just a little distracted, that I would, I would just zero in. I pray, Lord, in the time that we have together, that it be spent well. And I pray more than that, that you would convict us. You would help us. Help us to see, understand, hear, and obey, Lord, what you're trying to say to us. And I pray in particular, Lord, that you would, you would use these moments in our lives and I pray you speak to every heart. Lord, thank you for what we're going to do at the end of the service. We rejoice even more. But if you have your will and way right now, I ask in Christ's precious name. And amen. And amen. <clears throat> amen. 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 When we're talking about, uh, we're talking about sin, talking about sin, that is uh, some kind of ugly three-letter word, I believe. Uh, there's uh, lots of uh, ugly four-letter words, words like work and words like diet uh, and some others. And your mind went other places, and that's why you need to repent. But uh, and we, we've, got, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got those kind of things. Some of the worst trouble I ever gotten in, got into, uh, some of you were here for that three or four years ago, whenever it was. Now it's longer than that. Longer than that now, I said, I said you know, and, and I, I, I'd been taking the treatment and stuff like that. I said, you know, we've got to be able to do better than this. We've got to be able to do better than the hair sniffer and, and, the, and, the, and the hairdo, uh, referring to President Biden, President Trump, respectively. I said it, thought it was funny, and man, you'd have thought I spit on Jesus. Uh, and uh, folks, folks mad, folks calling me. I didn't even think anybody listened to my sermons, man. They heard that. And uh, so I don't do any throwaway lines about, uh, about anything like that. Uh, anymore, maybe I will, but uh, anyhow, and we're here, but if you want to really get riled up and you start talking about, sorry, about sin, weirdly, oddly, everybody in this room has a relationship. You have a strong relationship with sin, sinful habits, sinful behaviors. You've suffered the consequences of your sin, other people's sin. It's one of those things we just kind of, we kind of put off. We don't want to, we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to deal with whatever the scale tells us when we step on it. We want to deal with uh, piles, of, uh, piles of laundry. Or some of you have that stack of mail that's uh, hiding the bills and the, tra and, the, and the receipts and those kind of things. Uh, we don't want to deal with that noise under the hood. We just figure it'll just go away. And, and, we'll, uh, and we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that, and uh, and my man, we would uh, we don't want to deal with those. We don't deal we don't deal with homework. Anybody here a good procrastinator? You would raise your hand, but it'll take too much. Effort. Okay, yeah. uh, good procrastinator, man. I got to do this. Got to do those kind of things. I, I was talking to people, man. They were doing their taxes the day the taxes were due. I was nervous for them, uh, and uh, so those kind of things. Uh, <clears throat> I I, uh, I struggle sometimes with I struggle sometimes with uh, correspondence. Uh, I just I just. Uh, um, Something about it, especially the last few years, man, just pen to paper and writing a note. I don't know what it is, uh, but struggle. I've, I've got several thank you cards on my desk to do. Sometimes just procrastinate. Sometimes, sometimes we just don't want to see that. Don't want to see that. It's an amazing thing. I read a, a, a psychologist and a, and, a, and a sociologist had done a thing together. And they talked about when people, when people either had a... <laughs> uh, when, when people, people went through a bariatric surgery, some of those kind of things, and they talked about one of the things they, first things they did is they moved plants and stuff from in front of mirrors, and then or they went and bought different mirrors because before they had hid, and now they were okay. They were okay, and it was interesting when they wanted to see, but before when they were ashamed, they didn't want to see. And scriptures does that, Scripture does that for us. It is a mirror to show us, and we may just not like what we see. But you do have a relationship with sin. You do have a relationship with what God has said is wrong. And that's an important thing. What does the Bible say is wrong? What does the Bible say? What do the Ten Commandments say? What did Jesus say is wrong? I, I want to encourage you this morning. I've got a few things I want to help you with. But I want to encourage you. 
<clears throat> maybe you've never thought about this, or maybe you just think, man, I'm always supposed to feel shameful. I'm always supposed to feel bad. I'm, or those people are sinners and I have problems. That's, that's Rodney's definition. That's Rodney's definition of, uh, of that. I, I have problems. I have problems and other people. Other people have sins. Other people have sins. And so what, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say about it? And I would do, I normally do a little panel here, but I, I think everybody raise their hand if you think you, if, I don't know, anyone would say I don't have a relationship with sin. No relationship with sin. Why is this so important? I want to set this out and then I want to kind of prove from the life of David. That's right. I want to suggest to you, when we, when you and I don't deal with sin, we invite three things. One, you invite family disaster, you invite personal shame, and you invite spiritual judgment. <laughs> you can choose your sin, but you cannot choose your consequences. And when you're done with it, it won't be done with you. Samson learned three things. Sin will, bl sin will, sin will bind you, it will blind you, and it will grind you. And you have no extra, uh, you, you have no inside track, you have nothing that you're going to do. You can take all the supplements you want, but you will not avoid that. And when we don't deal with sin, you can just mark it down. Here it comes. It may be the pitter-patter, it may be a steam engine, it may be a dump truck headed at you. But when we don't deal with sin, I suggest to you, by the way, we live in a world that doesn't believe what I got on the screen. We absolutely live in a world that doesn't believe that. It won't be me, it won't be my family, it won't be my marriage, it won't be my girlfriend, it won't be my boyfriend, it won't be me with the law, it won't be me, it won't be me with my kids, it won't be me as a young person, it won't be me rebelling against my parents, it won't be me. And it will be. <clears throat> Sin is absolutely undefeated by us, but it's been absolutely defeated by King Jesus. And you can be free this morning. You can be free. And so I want to I do that. <clears throat> I want to I help us. I want to help us this morning. So I want to look at some elements. So I just got a few things here. If you're with me, say amen. With me. And we're in a weird season. I said this for a couple months. So, so the, the air may kick on. The fan may kick on. If you need to fan, if you need to fan, that's okay. If you're really hot, I got some water here. You can splash on your face. All right, number one, what happens when I don't deal with sin? What happens when I don't deal with sin? Four things. Four things. Are here. Number one, there's constant conviction. We see the summary here, but we can go to Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, and we'll turn to Psalm 51 in a minute. We can go there and look at this, and we see David has been publicly okay and privately dying. He will say in Psalm 51, My bones waxed old within me. My tears dried up. I stopped eating. I stopped sleeping. Say, I have a pretty healthy relationship with sin. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And that's not there. It's not done with you yet. You've calloused over that. And there's a catastrophe or something coming to your life that will wake you up and stir you. You just hadn't got to it yet. He's convicted. He knows better. One of my mentors said, at this point in David's life, he was a public success and a private failure. By the way... If you want to scare Rodney Holloman to death, use that expression on me. Be a public success and a private failure. I drove back from Nashville yesterday, one of my final acts as chairman of the CE Board, Christian Education Board for our churches here in Tennessee, hundreds of people there Friday night and Saturday. I drove back and one recurring thought I had was, man, alive, Rodney, don't you ever get used to being up there in front of people and neglect the personal devotion tonight and don't do those things, man, and God was just working on my heart. I stopped and pulled into Bucky's, man, I was under conviction and I'm, and I'm going back, I'm thinking about this message again, God, don't let me be like David who looked fine on the outside rotten on the inside don't let me get used to that keep my heart tender there's constant conviction you ever you ever talk to people something about spiritual things the lord or anything like that and man they just shut you down hard i mean there's an overtly uh, uh non-comparative reaction in other words it, it's just it's just wham that, that's conviction in your life. Sometimes the meanest people you meet are, man, just under conviction. Under conviction. I'm convinced, I'm convinced without a shadow of doubt, the substance abuse and, and all the things, man, people put in their vape pipes and, and all the drugs and all those kind of, man, they're trying desperately to tell their conviction, their conscience and the conviction to shut up. I don't want to hear it. 
We talked about the Thanksgiving taboos, the things you can't talk about. Some of you got people in your life, I mean, you can't talk about things, man, because they, when you get close, man, they are so convicted, they will just roar at you and bite at you. There's constant conviction. David experienced this. David experienced this. <clears throat> it's been 12 months. Best we can get it from Psalm 32 since he did what? Since he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He should have been out on the battlefield. <clears throat> since he was who he was with someone he wasn't supposed to. He knew exactly who he was. If I'm reading this right, Uriah was one of his mighty men. He was part of that inner circle. He didn't just betray a soldier. That was bad enough. He betrayed someone he had fought alongside. He knew well who Bathsheba was. Bathsheba should have said no, could have said no. Whatever's going on, at some point she enters into this, and they come together. They have, a, they, they have a sinful relationship, and that sinful relationship, God sends a child. He's still lying and scheming, and he sends Uriah, his soldier, back. After getting Uriah drunk, he sends him back and does what? He says, with his own death note, you pull the men back, let the battle rage, and he has the Ammonites, the people of Ammon, he has them murder him. <clears throat> Don't miss it. Don't miss it. It's a disaster. And David carries on. And God tells Nathan, you go confront him. It's been a year. No joy, no peace, no fellowship. David's testimony, Psalm 32, sleepless nights, physical illness, fever, weight loss, haunted memories. And let me help you. When you don't deal with sin, when you don't repent, when you don't keep the lines of communication open, when you're not constantly saying, Lord, nothing between you and me, then you, you feel alone. There is no loneliness like the loneliness of being unrepentant. We used to sing... Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Uh, when Andre and I first uh, first ministry, we were or, uh, I, got, I got to lead and we served at as a senior pastor. We had a Christian school. We had different things, and the church had built in the in the town, kind of built out and built around it. Not not terribly unlike here. We were two blocks from the main road. At the, end of the, at the end of the road, just a little bit to the right, was a, was a huge grocery store, very, very convenient. Across from it was a Burger King, a Burger King. And so the Burger King's there, and then there was a battery shop behind that, and then the next block over would be, would be our church. Between the grocery store and, and a pretty good size a trailer park, tra a trailer courtyard, was, was our church. And so people walked the grocery store came back by and just lots of folks in traffic. We had a Christian school, so we had cameras, height and alert. There was an empty field there. Across the empty field was a little strip mall, a Chinese place and this kind of thing. And so there was a lot of interaction, a lot of traffic. Uh, we had speed bumps, all these kind of things set out to slow people down. We, we had all that. But we had people, we had people come in and just stretch their legs. They'd come back with grocery bags. I sat there one afternoon, it was a Friday afternoon, I sat there one afternoon and I counted, I counted, I counted case after case after case of alcohol just coming right by me. Coming right by my, my window as I, I was in the office and, I, and people were walking home and they were walking home with their groceries and, and I just, man, my, my heart just broke. I, I, I went from being, I went from being hypercritical and mm, to going, man, that guy's worked all week, he cashed his paycheck, he's gone in as much alcohol as he can carry. Because I finally figured out he's not driving down there. He's walking because he's, he's lost his license. I mean, person after person. I'd visit over there. I'd visit children. I'd visit children, I mean, who'd kick through the cans to get to open, open the door at 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning. And I found myself again going, what kind of conviction, what kind of conscience are you trying to smash that you're doing that? David here. It's constant conviction. Your relationship with sin, you may get used to sin, you may callous over, but there is that undertow. There is that undertow. You will never go any further in your walk with God than your last unrepented of sin. Psalm 32, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through the day. For my day and night your hand was heavy upon me. And my moisture has turned to the drought of summer. I have cried all my tears out. Number two, there's going to be an emotional confrontation. There's going to be an emotional confrontation. You can mark it down. When you don't deal with sin, man, it, it's, it's going to happen. 
It's going to happen. Somebody, somewhere, something. It, it, may, it may look all kinds of things. It may be a family member. It, it, may be, it may be a pastor. It may, whatever it is. There's something. It may just be you. You may just be so broken one day on your face and you're just there and you're looking in the mirror and you're going, man, I don't want to live this way anymore. It's emotional confrontation. When you don't deal with it swiftly and privately, there's almost always a confrontation. There's three that are mentioned here. One is the public humiliation. It's going to come out. Before that was the private rebuke. I, I've really thought about this for all these years now. I used to think Nathan went in there and put his finger, thou art the man. I've done this long enough. I don't think so anymore. Well, I, don't, I don't have anything but my imagination. I really do think it was a broken-hearted prophet who went. It's you. Because I have yet to ever be happy confronting somebody with sin. I'm not happy when somebody confronts me with my sin. And I've yet to have anybody gleefully rejoice and thunder at me. They've been broken. I see no reason to doubt that Nathan the prophet in front of the mighty king says, it's you. It's you. There's an emotional confrontation. The best friend you'll ever have is a Christian friend who will tell you when you're wrong and trying to help you repent. Best friend you'll ever have. I mean, you don't need to do that. You don't need that way. You don't want to talk that way. You don't, you don't need to ignore those kind of things. Ignore those kind of things. And there's this emotional confrontation. You still with me? Say amen. Number three, there's, there, there ought to be a broken confession. There ought to be a broken confession. <clears throat> uh, uh, some of you have asked questions. Some of you, before you get baptized, just asked some great questions the other day. <clears throat> what about this? What about that? And Every so often, some, I'll have somebody, you know, you know I, uh, I need to get saved in church. I need, I need to repent of my sins and get saved in church. And, and I love that idea, but that's just, this is not true. You, you, you can get saved all kinds of places. It's kind of, it's, uh, I think you ought to make your public profession to other believers. Nod your head if you're with me there. I think, I think you ought to do that. Uh, but there's nothing, <clears throat> there's, there's, no, uh, there's no, there might be, but I don't think there's any power pad under the floor. Uh, uh, Mike and, uh, Mike and uh, Jeff Grind's staff, Mike Lawson and Jeff Grind are trying to find out where some of the, some of the, uh, the uh, things lead out of the church. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, and so, uh, so we're, we're not where uh, some of the gutters lead out of the church. There might be some gutters under here, uh, some flow spouts. But anyway, I'm, I'm joking about that. But I don't know, but there's nothing, nothing about that. <coughs> nothing, nothing significant that's there. And, and the other thing is, man, you ain't got to cry. Some of you hadn't cried yet. Uh, some of you cried looking at the NFL draft going, what's my team doing? Uh, but, uh, but other than that, you, you know, you don't. Some of you are just not wired that way. Not your head if you understand. You can be broken and not shed a tear. And you can be full of pride and haughtiness and put on the fake crocodile and let everybody think that something's going on. When I'm talking about a broken confession, David says what? Verse 13. Against thee, I have sinned against the Lord. Psalm 51, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Confession, two words in the original language there, homo legeo, homo same, or homo same, legeo, words, same words. I'm saying the same thing the scripture says. I'm saying the same thing God's saying. It's not that I have a problem, not that I made a mistake. I have sinned. I should not have blasphemed. I should not have dropped that F-bomb. I should not have been angry. I should not have gossiped. I should not have done that. I should not have cheated on my spouse. I should not have slept with somebody who's not white. I should not, I, whatever it was, the Bible says so, and I, I'm on the same page. I am, I am a sinner, and I need to be saved. I am a Christian, and I've let this sin come in my life, and I know it's going to tear me all to pieces, and I'm not doing that. I'm not sorry I got caught. I am sorry that I sinned. All transgression is rebellion. You're there. You're there in your Bible. Just flip over to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. I got just a few minutes here. Psalm 51. Look at those first verses. Would you, would you do that? If you got your Bibles or your tablets, I don't think I, I don't know if I printed them or not. Psalm 51. Verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Everybody who's ever used a fountain pen understands if you hit that wet ink with a tissue paper, it'll lift it right up. It's an amazing thing to behold. 
This was the style of writing. They would take that in, even now, surviving to 2023, the word blotter has the exact same idea. Bounty paper towels advertise it. You can blot up your spills like they were never there. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned, done this evil in thy sight. Thou mightest be justified when you speak and be clear when you're judges, man. And you want to get right with God. You understand, man, it's a vertical thing. David, as a follower of Christ, has let this awfulness come in his life. It's affected so many people. And now he's finally talking some sense. Nope. I, I confess. I confess. You may hear niece, nephew, child, grandchild ever tried to get them to own up something they were doing. And you won't let them go until they spit out what it was. Some of you, some of you used to go, say, I'm sorry. And the kid smirked, say. And they didn't do nothing. They didn't do anything except figure out that they're smarter than you are. Say, sorry. Say, you shouldn't have done it. Say, you, say you didn't know. All right. Well, and, and, and then you wrestle. Why? Why? Because the rebellion is set in. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. By the way, if you think getting young people to do that, getting children to do that, man, try and get an adult to do that. Oh, my word. Man, I got a headache just thinking about it. Because why? We don't want to do it. Man. But when there's real repentance, man, there's a broken confession. I am on the same page. Part of repentance is confessing accurately. Confessing accurately, I have done this against you. And I'm glad, I'm glad, number four, there can be a glorious, glorious, glorious confession. There can be a glorious confession. <clears throat> and there can be, a, excuse me, a broken confession. There can be a glorious cleansing. Purge me with hyssop. I shall be clean. Wash me. I'll be whiter than the snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Let me help you here. The devil will jump onto your shoulders. The demons, your own conscience, maybe if it's misinformed or your own, or your, or your, own, uh, your own background, and will say, you will never get over this. You will never do any better. You will always be in bondage to this addiction. You will never get over, never get over being hung over. You will never get over jumping from bed to bed. You will never get over that awful tongue and that terrible temper. You will never do that. That is not from the Lord. That shame and that kill and that, and that brokenness, that crushing, the Bible says and reminds you, you can be free because he has made you free. Truth of the matter is, Romans 6 says, if you're a follower of Christ, you already are free. You may just not know it. He has broken the bonds and bounds of your cha chains of your sin. He has set you above. He's called you his child. He's given you his Holy Spirit. You don't have to live that way anymore. You can be free. You can be clean. If you're a follower of Christ, man, and you're just in a mess, you can, you can be clean again today. You can be free again today. So what, will, what will people think? Let me, let me change your question. What does God already know? What does God already know? <clears throat> it's a big day for me. My early 30s, late 20s, I think the Internet came about. Early 30s, I was like so many people. Man, I had temptations I had never dreamed of at the other end of my keyboard. We were moving. We were moving, and uh, we were going to move into a house, a uh, house there by the house there by the prison. On what was their name? Of the road? You remember? Nashboro. We were moving somewhere. We were moving, and I, I was going to have my own office. <coughs> It was a prison at one end of the road, and there was a country club at the other end. It was, a, it was an interesting place to live. And uh, I tried not to visit either one, <laughs> and uh, too very much, for, unless I had a good reason. And, uh, and we were there moving in, and I was, I was going to have my own office, or my own little study. And one of the things we did is, is we made sure that the monitor was against the wall and that my back would be to anybody walking up, that there was absolutely no way I could hide anything because I had figured out I don't need any help sinning in this area. Truth of the matter is, uh, and it's only been recently and it's just an extra step for people, but every screen in this, in this, in this building is facing like that. <clears throat> and I just, I, 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 for, for, uh, for one reason, my, mine's a little turn right now in, in the other office. 
I don't want anything. We've got filters in the belt. I, I, I don't need any help sinning. As good as the cleansing is, it's just simply better not to have to say I'm sorry. And I don't want to live in such a way it hurts his heart. There can be a glorious cleansing. And I talk to young people. I talk to adults sometimes. And man, they're just, I mean, I'm never going to get past this. And God can never forgive me. And I can never be restored. And all these kind of things. I would remind you that David's not even in the second act of his life. He, he is barely in the third. And there will be more after this. And God can cleanse you and can restore you. And all those kind of things. But don't forget, there's always, there's always, Heartbreaking consequences. And heaven is tremendous. And being justified by faith is, is more than I can imagine. But being justified by faith does not take away earthly consequences. It just doesn't. By the way, how many of you are glad when God not only forgives, but then he covers? And sometimes that's... Sometimes that's how he chooses, typically when the sin is confessed early on. What do you mean? Well, their child passes away. <clears throat> their family, just his direct children, it's just one mess after another, resulting in the death of his son. He loses a baby, and then he loses the adult son. I have no context for that, but I have yet to meet a person who's buried a child, buried their child who would wish it on a worst enemy. There's violence in the family. There's division in the family. <clears throat> R.G. Lee said it like, I'm sorry, Vance Havner said it like this, when you're done with sin, it's not done with you. I mentioned Samson. It will bind you, blind you, and grind you. So this Two, two groups of folks I've talked to, and I'm, I'm about done if you'll look at me. I'm talking to a group of folks here, and you, you've never asked Christ to save you from your sins. You feel guilty. You feel ashamed. Maybe you're mad. Maybe you're mad. I can't believe somebody would say that I'm not a good person. I, again, it didn't really matter what I said. It matter what the Bible says. And the Bible has said, the Bible has said, you and I are not good people. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. For the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For all of sin, Romans 3, 20, and come short of the glory of God. You understand correctly. And if you're pushing back on that, that's you going, man, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. And I'm best friend. You've got saying you can be free. God wants to change your life. You're not just raising your hand. I'd like to get an insurance policy. God wants to change your life right now. Heaven is a wonderful fringe benefit. It is not the end all be all. God did not die just to give us a better place to spend the rest of eternity. He died because you were in desperate need of righteousness and you needed to be forgiven. And you were under his heavy end of judgment. If you've never done that, and you say, well, I was baptized or somebody prayed with me or, or this or that. Again, any work has not saved you. It is through his precious blood. The fact that he died, he was buried, and then he rose again. And if you would go after him, you would follow him. The Bible says he would change your life. The old preacher said, I've said so many times, if he is what you was then you ain't if God has not changed your life then you may have had a wonderful spiritual experience but that was not biblical salvation because he has changed you and he has changed you if any man's in Christ he's a new creation old things are passed away all things are becoming new and you may be here as a follower of Christ and you go man I have let so much mess in my life and I never meant to get where I'm at I never meant to let the bitterness get in here I never let the emotional relationship turn physical. I never meant the occasional this or that to turn into a habit that I can't turn free of. I, I, never, I never meant. And you're as thin as an Easter egg chocolate bunny, spiritually right now. And just as hollow and rotten inside as you can be. And everything in your flesh says, don't you dare let anybody know how it's going on. But you're just moments away from crumbling. Psalm 32 is your psalm. Let me help you. Psalm 51 can be your psalm. You can be gloriously cleansed. You can be restored. You can experience joy again. You can with new found emotion in your voice. 
Man, he saved me. He changed me. He forgave me. And he forgave me again. He changed me again. He's cleaned me up again. You don't have to live the way you're living. Shame and guilt will keep you a slave. But you can be free. You can have victory. I said it, uh, my notes say I said it a couple years ago, so I, I know I've said it recently enough. I finished up, I finished, I finished up my sophomore year of uh, college, and man, I was just struggling. If, if there was a temptation or a, or a bad habit, it seemed like you could pick up and still put on like you had it all together, nod your head if you're still with me. It seemed like, it seemed like I found those. I didn't know how to talk to people about it. Everybody I knew, everybody I knew, everybody I knew seemed like they had their act together, and I was the only person who didn't. I figured out that's not reality. That's just how you feel when you've got guilt and shame. But man, I, there I was. So I'm I'm 19. I'm 19, man, and I am just man. I am just struggling. I'm struggling. I'm struggling because I'm I'm so thin. I'm I'm I'm, I'm like I said. I'm I'm thin as that chocolate Easter bunny. And uh, going through the motions and struggling. Don't know why I can't seem to get a handle on things. And, and the way our chapel service, we had chapel, I think, four days a week back then. Where our chapel service were, um, you, you could sit wherever you wanted, and I, and I, I just started sitting on the front. I, I, a lot of the times, actually sat beside whoever the guest speaker was. They would come sit out. They'd give me an attaboy for sitting up front. And I didn't have the heart to tell them I wasn't sitting up front because I was spiritual. I, I, I was sitting up front so there'd just be fewer steps to go forward. I, I knew I was going forward. I, I knew I knew unless the guy unless the guy you know preached on detonating a nuclear bomb, I was a good chance I was going forward. I, I was guilty before he started preaching. I was ashamed for him. I struggled with anything I could think of. And sure enough, man, he whoever was preaching, I'd, I'd go forward and it was it was compounding my guilt. That's such a good young man. He's sitting up there, man, he's tender heart and go forward. I sit in the front, tend your heart, and maybe, but going forward, just because I, I, I just, just, just dying inside. And then really got a hold of Romans 6, Amen. Romans 7. Amen. That I am absolutely, positively free. Amen. And if I sin as a believer, I sin because I choose to. I don't sin anymore because I have to. First John became precious. I memorized pretty good chunks of it back then. I can know, I can know, I can know, I can know. Because the more you let sin fester in your life, the more you feel like you don't belong to him. You want to lose your assurance quickly, man, you just let that stuff roll and snowball. Maybe you're like me. Maybe in your heart you're going, I should be sitting on the front row just to make it a little few more steps because of all the mess going on in my life. And maybe you look just great, but you feel just that thin. I invite you to understand your relationship with sin has changed and can change. And you can be free. And if you follow Christ, you are free. You may just need to start acting like it.